Ephesians 3, 1 through 6. For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it is has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This is the mystery that the Gentiles are, are that their fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Bring uh, Dylan home. This is the sad tagline that is still uh, spread today in Nova Scotia. Uh, Dylan Ayler vanished almost without a trace. He is just a tender uh, age of three years. And he almost vanished without a trace from his grandmother's backyard uh, just last year, May 6th, 2020. And every moment since then, obviously, has been agony uh, for his mother, Ashley Brown, and his father, Jason Ayler. As I was reading this article uh, this week, I became aware of this situation for the first time. The saddest part of the article for me uh, was when the father, Jason Ayler, began to recount, pointing to a pile of wrapped gifts in the living room. Uh, the father, Jason, is quoted, those are all Dylan's Christmas presents. Uh, birthday presents and my presents, and I won't open a present again until he's found. Dylan is still missing. Now that is sad enough as a father myself, uh, but this next line uh, broke my heart. There is no God. I prayed so many times. There's just nothing. Now, here's why it's sad for me. Now, first, as a fellow father, I lost my son once at the CNE. Uh, it was completely my fault. Um, but thankfully, uh, Christopher had the wherewithal to... My, my wife was uh, where music was playing. Uh, there was a sort of a live band going on, and he remembered that, and he had the wherewithal to follow the music back to his mom. Um, and so I can deeply appreciate the horror, the shock for those five minutes that felt like an eternity where I thought I actually lost my son. And I want to, as much as possible, fully appreciate the agony, um, the death-like feelings that this family is going through. But there's a sadness that's even greater than what they are facing try to capture it in, in this thought. There is a lostness more dire than a missing child on earth. There is a heavenly father searching for and longing to rescue his child more passionately than any anxious earthly father looking for their child on earth. And that lostness that is more dire than is to be eternally lost, to be eternally lost. And it, it's so easy to become so consumed with this life that we lose that perspective. We, we lose an eternal reality and just an awareness of that. And we just go on busily with our anxious lives here on this earth. I think God would want Jason Ayler to know that, and this is hard to, to roll off the tongue, I think God would want Jason Ayler to know that even if he never finds his boy on this earth, the best chance of being reunited to his beloved son is to know Christ in eternity best chance. I'll just leave it at that. But my point is, in these questions, do we know the Father's heart for us?
because there's a Father in heaven who is searching for and longing to rescue even more passionately than any earthly anxious father, as many children, as many human beings, to call them sons and daughters, and for them to be known as sons and daughters while they live on this earth, but most consequentially, most importantly, forever in eternity. And do you and I share the Father's heart for those outside of faith in Christ? Now, first, that's a question right to the church, to the Christ follower. Do you share the Father's heart for those outside of faith in Christ? Now, if you're joining us today and you're still an unbelieving friend who has not placed faith in Christ, what I hope you will gain today is insight into what should motivate Christians. And if you have a friend who brought you here um, or, or who, who nags you at times, uh, I hope that you'll get, gain insight into why, why we take the time to share about Jesus with you. And so today I want to speak to the church's mission. I, I think that's what today's passage, what we see Paul's heart for the church's mission. And I want to throw out four qualities of Christian mission. Excuse the uh, mistyped reference. It's Ephesians 3, uh, 1 to 6. Uh, and my heart for all of us, and uh, just a summary of where we're going today, if this prayer would stir in our hearts by faith um, as a result of just sitting uh, under this passage, Lord, keep maturing me. Keep maturing me missionally. Keep maturing me as a Christ follower missionally. One of the first edges of a Christian that in my own life and through observation of 20 plus years of ministry, the first edge of a Christian that goes dull uh, is always the evangelistic edge. It's always the reaching out edge, the, the missional edge. That's the first edge that always seems to go dull. Now, let me define then, just so that we're on the same page, what uh, I mean by missional and being on mission. Being missional, basically, it's just an adjective to, to describe being on mission as a Christian for Christ, okay? And this is my best attempt to, as simply as possible, summarize what, what the scope of Scripture, I think, would have us understand as being on mission uh, for Christ and his kingdom. Now, uh, this is my best attempt at a simple definition, but you're going to realize that it's not simple. Uh, being on mission and having, keeping that edge and, and, and having that mentality, it's something to keep maturing into. It's not something simple. But here's my best attempt. First, being on mission means purposefully, and the best analogy that I want to commend to you is, is like farming, okay? Being on mission is purposely farming Christ's kingdom on earth. Uh, it's to continually have that mindset to sow seeds, to continue to water, to tend to uh, all, all those investments of, of seeds, of sowing, and to care with follow-up conversations and prayer. And you go through seasons. You have to approach this as a farmer on a marathon of just tilling the ground, working the ground through season after season. And then, of course, there's uh, an analogous, similar to the farmer, there's the layer of just depending on God to send the rains, so to speak, to, to do his divine part, to cause everything to grow. So being on mission first is having that mindset of farming Christ's kingdom on earth, but very specifically, I want to be definite here, through the church. It's in the context of being part of a local church and Beyond that, seeing in your own heart, seeing that connection to Christ Church universal through time and realizing that you're connected, to not, it's not just yourself, but you're part of this grand story, this grand Christian movement through history, but through the church, as you're connected to the church, and then by primarily obeying the Great Commission, Jesus' Great Commission, the, the what ties it all together is the focus of making disciples. Making disciples. Being 
a disciple who makes disciples. That's the overarching lens. That, that's the, the, the strong color and shade that should uh, influence, over-influence everything else. That where all this is going is that we're trying to make effort to make more disciples, but being motivated by the great commandment. Uh, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and to love our neighbor as Christ has loved us. That's Jesus' tweak on the second greatest commandment, which is like the first. Uh, he tweaks that, not just to love your neighbor as yourself, but to love your neighbor as he has loved us. That needs to be our motivation because we've been loved by God. We want to make disciples. And with all your gifts, this is where everyone needs to take the time to take stock of how God has shaped you and gifted you from just learned skills and competencies to uh, divine spiritual gifts that the Spirit has imparted upon your life. And again, within the context of the local church, to, to build up the church that becomes a place where we can make disciples and where we can invite others to be a part of faith life uh, in church community and to be discipled as well, but with all your gifts. And we need to have the mentality of this being at all times. This is a life mindset in all places, wherever we go, with all peoples. Okay? Now, what this means is, as we, if you can just picture, uh, just the farming analogy, if from one seed and then there's crop and then more seed and more crop. And, and Jesus himself compared the kingdom as something small that grows into something large and influential. And that should be our prayer and our desire and our goal that we long to see the kingdom really influence our culture and our society. And certainly there were times in history where that was happening naturally just because of the number of Christians there were in society, in that city, in, in the culture. Certainly, at least Toronto, as we think of our immediate context, uh, that tide has turned. But nevertheless, we should be living into that, praying for that, and continuing to hope for that, to be on mission. And so for the rest of our time in the passage, I want to ask, how do I nurture a missional heart? I think Paul gives us insight. I want to draw at least four. And so the first idea is, to embrace the gospel's clear reason for mission. You need to constantly clarify, why am I on mission? Why am I doing these things? And even going back to the definition I offered to you, that we're motivated by God's great love as he has loved us, and now to want to love him back and to love our neighbor as Christ has loved us, that, that's a good starting point. But Paul here, I want you to see that he actually says now, picking up in verse 1, for this reason. For this re reason. So Paul himself, he has laser-focused reason. I imagine he returned to it as often as he could in his thinking and his heart. Especially as he was writing this from prison and, and facing uh, the persecution and, and imprisonment that he was for the sake of Christ. When you're in that kind of situation, you need to constantly be reminded of, why am I doing this? Why is this worth it? Now, in the flow of the letter, for this reason is a pivot point, and basically it points to everything prior, especially the immediate verses that we unpacked last week. And uh, just as a quick summary, this reason points to the fact that God has made even non-Jewish people uh, welcome that he has made them who are once aliens and strangers to be a part of the household of God. For this reason, he has a clear reason. This is important because, well, it's good to pay attention to emotions, your emotions, uh, generally speaking, but especially when you're trying to cha uh, share your faith and do uh, the work of Christ and build his kingdom, and build up the church. If ever, if you're like me at times, maybe even a certain comparison or judgmentalism or you think of others, why aren't they doing this and that? That's a good sign. Whoa, my reason for being on mission has gone astray. And so it's good to have a clear gospel reason. Let's continue to unpack that. But before we do that, 
The next idea is, how do I nurture a missional heart? Also embrace the fact that we should not be surprised at some cost to fulfill your mission. There will be a cost at some point. Paul says, for this reason, I, Paul, and he makes it clear, he he doubly uh, owns it. I, and he says his name here, Paul, I, a prisoner for Christ Jesus. And there he describes himself, I think both literally, because he was in shackles in prison, So literally, he was a prisoner for Christ because of the gospel. And second, I think, sort of metaphorically or symbolically, like in his heart, he was captured by Christ. He found the one person, the one reason most worth living for. And so he was completely enamored, captured, captivated by Christ. And so... Paul is a prisoner for Christ Jesus. And so if we seek to influence our surroundings as Christians, there will eventually be a cost. The simple logic behind that is the more faithfully we follow Jesus, the more naturally uh, and inevitably you will be different from the world. Now we need to think of it this way. I know I've been using the word cost, but you have to be careful with that word because that can easily, just in our still being sanctified hearts, um, we can begin to make too much of ourselves. And there we can begin to feel holier than thou. We can begin to feel judgmental. We can begin to uh, even go to the place of condemning others. Now, so I want you to think of it from the other side of the same coin in terms of Jesus' worth, okay? I think Paul was able to say, I, Paul, a willing prisoner for Christ Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was so, uh, just he, he could not help but respond to Christ as worth it. And so Jesus is worth, is worth, any emotional, physical, social, financial, and I'll use the word effort here, okay? I mean the same thing as cost, but, but what I want us to, the, the, the perspective, the focus that I want us to have is that, and we've all experienced this in our lives, where someone or something is worth it, we're willing to really put effort into that pursuit. We really are. Just ask any couple that is in love. Just ask anyone who is vying for that promotion. We could go on and on. If something is worth it, then natural effort comes out. You're willing to have to pay some cost. And so from sort of the beautiful side of things, Jesus is worth any of these costs and to make effort. Now in these times, and I know what I'm about to bring up, uh, it, it, it can quickly, quickly, uh, it, it's like a minefield, what I'm about to bring up, and it, will, it can quickly uh, just spiral down to, to heated political discussions. And that's not my intent. But nevertheless, to just observe our times. Uh, the fact that there are sincere, intelligent, uh, well-thought-through Christ followers for legitimate reasons are not getting vaccinated. And therefore, they work for an institution or organization. Not all, not all corporations or, or companies and organizations are like this, but there are some that are actually they're forced, they're either getting fired or they're losing their jobs because of things related to their faith. Decisions and conclusions that they're making out of a sincere deliberation, an intelligent deliberation that's connected to an overflow of their faith. 
Okay? And we live in a time where all the more these kind of costs are, are becoming more uh, right there in front of our face. Okay? Now again, I'm going to make the disclaimer on the other end as I finish this sort of just example in society. I don't mean to bring that up to politicize. I'm just saying, matter of fact, on the surface, there are people facing costs. Okay? Now, I hope what's in their heart, as they, in their good conscience between them and God, that the driving motive is Jesus is worth it. And whatever, however life unfolds after this, that I have a good God who's going to continue to care for me, who's going to continue to provide ways for me to continue to live and be on mission for Him. And that's an extreme example. Uh, but certainly for all of us, uh, as we uh, just look, go about our day, there's going to be at some point some cost if you're going to be on mission and really seeking to uh, promote Jesus. Now, what we need to all the more doubly um, understand that, uh, just answering the question, how do I nurture a missional heart? We need to ask the Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit for the Trinity's missional heart. That's, that needs to be our source, our energy, our resource, our, where we find strength to continue to be on mission in the gentle, winsome, loving, compassionate manner that the New Testament calls us to. In my reading of the New Testament, um, I, I think it's clear that we're not meant to be militant as Christians. It's easy to take that word mission and, and to quickly uh, militarize it or, or to make it think that it's supposed, we're supposed to be this you know, just violent force in the world. But as I see the New Testament, at least uh, until Christ returns, the church is uh, called to, to be gentle in our answers, to be gracious, uh, to, to speak wisely and winsomely to uh, the world. And where do we get that? We get that from the Father's heart, the Son's immense sacrificial love, and the Spirit's empowering. And where do I see this? Paul says, he goes on, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles. Now, when he says, on behalf of you Gentiles, what, what does he mean by that? Again, you have to always read uh, passages in context, and I encourage you, uh, this letter is short enough that as we're going through this as a series, uh, just continue to read it through it several times throughout the series. And so if, if you read everything before, you see that Paul is bursting. He's bursting with joy. He's thrilled that God and this mystery that he has been willing to welcome the outsider. And so this phrase, on behalf of you Gentiles, it's, it's really a summary. Paul is saying, I can't help but reach out to you because of how first God has reconciled me to himself. As Jesus even uh, encountered and stopped Paul on the road to Damascus. And then understanding how wide and deep and high and far God the Father's heart actually spreads to long for as many to come and be a part of his household again. So that phrase, on behalf of you Gentiles, it's reflective of Paul knowing the Father's heart. That's what all the verses before point to. So we need to ask, it's nothing short of the Holy Spirit continuing to remind you first of the Father's heart for you. That's why we asked at the beginning, do you know the Father's heart? Do you know the Father's heart for those outside the family? Do you know that the Father's heart is, I have to be precise with my words here, I don't think God is anxious, but he is certainly more passionate than Jason Ayler who is in agony to find his son. I mean, so much so that he was willing to send his very own son so that we could be found. So as the Spirit reminds us of 
the Father's heart, the Son's sacrificial love, and the Spirit's voice that continually calls out, what that comes down to is that we need to be on mission by faith. By faith. The, the, the Christian, each and every day, it, it's just a, a renewal to walk by faith. To walk by faith. To, and faith means to unite yourself to Christ, to choose to look out onto the world, on yourself, on the people around you through God's eyes. That's what it means by faith. And to give you three aspects of this faith then, we need to be on mission by faith, first fueled by God's revealed word. This is what's going to, if you think of being on mission like a locomotive, a beautiful old school classic, uh, powerful locomotive. And you know at the front, uh, there are workers throwing in coals and, and wood to keep that engine going and to move powerfully forward. Similarly, you and I need to be fueled by God's revealed word. Where do we see this? As we go on now, Paul continues, uh, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard, you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. So here already there's this dynamic of something being told and heard. And Paul here, he's first A, speaking of his call to specifically be God's messenger. God sent one, his apostles, his apostle to the Gentile world. But part and parcel with that is the whole message of the gospel, of grace. And so they've heard because someone said it, someone declared it, told it. And Paul goes on to unpack, you've heard of God's grace that was given to me for you. And he elaborates how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. Now, this mystery, it's not just for Paul, but he's talking about God's great mystery for all of humanity, but Paul certainly was given insight so that he could explain it and preach it and teach it and for it to be recorded for the church as a foundation for the church to be built on the mystery of the gospel. And this word revelation is so important for the Christ follower because what it means is that apart from God, speaking from the outside in, in, apart from God intervening into history, into our lives, we would not know who God is and how to relate to Him, His heart for us, the fact that we're sinners and we need His grace. We would not know that God's way to, to, to solve the problem of our sin is through Christ. If you look at the Bible from beginning to end, it all points to God's solution. It's God's divine revelation. The opposite of revelation is speculation. And that's still going on a lot. You don't have to uh, even just, if, if you approach strangers, you don't have to approach more than, I'd say, like two people to find out that people love making up their own ideas of God. Well, if God exists, then I think He should be like blank. And most often, it will be a reflection of what is convenient for their life. And so this word revelation, this truth, this doctrine is so important that we would not know who God is and how to be saved apart from God divinely revealing, revealing Himself. That we know God through revelation, not speculation. And so I love that Paul here he goes on to describe, when you read this. And Paul knows that what he's written, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. He knows that this letter of Ephesians is divinely inspired. And he's saying it boldly. He's saying that God has inspired me. He's revealed this. And I'm putting it down on paper. And this is for you to keep. This is to be um, continued on and passed on through the ages to the church. And Paul knows what's going on here. And so here we see a description of God's revealed word. This is certainly, most certainly, one distinction of Trinity Grace Church from, uh, if we're distinguished from any other churches out there, 
this would be one distinction that we continue to receive gladly the 66 books, this wonderful bibliography called the Bible from Genesis to Revelation as God's revealed word. It's his word that he's guided through history. He's inspired with all the questions we could have about it to be fueled by faith and by faith to be on mission, fueled by God's revealed word. But also, to be on mission by faith, it, it, it's to have faith in Jesus Christ. I know that this is a basic, but this is a foundation. If this foundation is gone, then you don't have Christianity. And we need to keep coming back to faith in Jesus. And I like to say, Jesus the Christ. <laughs> Meaning, I'm intentionally looking to Jesus, and it's easy to overlook, forget that Christ is a title. Christ, when we say Jesus Christ, we really mean Jesus the Christ. He is the Christ chosen by God. He is the saving Messiah. He is the King that God himself has chosen and been glad to uh, affirm and to elevate to the place of his right hand. And so we need to be on mission by faith in Jesus the Christ. And so Paul goes on. Where do we see this? He goes on. I hope you'll perceive insight, my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations that is at it, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And so Paul here again just and I think the point is here, I, I want you to be convinced. I got more convinced this week as I was uh, preparing this message and all the more just uh, bolstered in my faith. Thank you, Lord, for revealing yourself to me through your word. Thank you that you've left these holy scriptures. And I get it. The whole point, the scriptures don't reveal just to how to feel better about yourself. But the scriptures don't reveal um, just a little bit of advice uh, for day to day, and how to, you know, resolve conflict, how to better interpersonal skills. You can glean all that from Scripture. It's all there. That's not what the, the main point of what God has revealed, what He's longing to reveal. No, it's the mystery of Christ. Now, the word here, mystery, uh, it, it basically means something that prior was a mystery, was unknown. And it has that nuance of then came a de definite point in time where it was revealed, the big reveal. And Paul is trying to get at here, God has been working towards this all through history, right from Adam and Eve, through Israel, through all of history, and now it's coming to a head. It has come to a head, in fact. And so we're to understand, okay, this is God's plan. That's just another way to, to digest that notion of the mystery of Christ. This is God's plan. This is the way He wants to do it. And all this points to, so we need to be on mission by faith with hope. If you have genuine, spirit-filled, uh, Scripture-fueled faith, then what also will fuel your mission is that hope of the new creation. We see this in the last uh, verse here, verse 6. This mystery as well, the mystery of Christ is also the mystery that the Gentiles, those outside of ethnic Israel, are, and here's where we see future, fellow heirs. Heirs points to future. An heir receives an inheritance in the future, at a future point in time. Members of the same body. This is pointing to the new creation. The church of Christ is, in a sense, a new humanity, a new creation. You and I, in Christ, I know this is, this is mind-blowing, and it's hard to really let it sink in and, 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 and to connect to our everyday lives, but you are a new human being if you're united to Christ. A new creation. 
And that new creation, that sense of new creation, ultimately points this members of the same body that is a new creation, it points ultimately to the future, to that hope. And here, partakers of the promise. Meaning, there's still promises of God that are yet to be fulfilled. So again, this is future-oriented. This is why we hope. We are on mission by faith with hope of the new creation. I love uh, the hymn, Facing a Task Unfinished. I'll just read you a few verses here. Facing a task unfinished that drives us to our knees. A need that undiminished rebukes our slothful ease. We who rejoice to know you, renew before your throne the solemn pledge we owe you to go and make you known. Where other lords beside you hold their unhindered sway, where forces that defied you defy you still today, with none to heed their crying, for life and love and light, unnumbered souls are dying and pass into the night. And I love this verse. We bear the torch that flaming fell from the hands of those who gave their lives proclaiming that Jesus died and rose. This face is uh, Jermaine Thomas. And he's uh, special to me because I have Korean blood, uh, because uh, Christian history reports that he was one of the first martyrs, uh, a British missionary that took the gospel to Korea. He was one of the first martyrs for the sake of Christ in Korea. And I wouldn't be here today if he hadn't done what he'd done for the sake of Christ, being on mission, And from there, all the domino effects. All the other missionaries that came and eventually through generations, the gospel getting to my mom, being the first believer in her family. My dad as well, first believer in his family. And then being sustained by God's grace uh, and and doing their best to uh, raise us in a Christian household. And so that, that hymn, it, it spokes to, speaks to men like missionary Thomas here. All of us, all of us, if we take the time, we can point to someone very significant or someone, some saint in the past, even whose blood. I dare say for all of us, there's some saint who shed their blood who gave their life, and ultimately going back to the saint, Jesus Christ. Lord, keep maturing me missionally. Keep maturing me missionally. Let's pray. Lord, Um, help us first to start in the place of remembering that this is a glad message. Uh, These saints of old who passed down the torch, ours is the same commission to continue to carry this glad message of the Father's heart. Help us to believe for those of us who have placed faith in Jesus, that that was the heart with which you sought us. That your spirit called out to our hearts like a father anxiously longing to find his child. And even more lovingly, even with more passion, longing to bring us back home. And God, from there, help us to not grow tired 
or apathetic, and that you would keep us on mission by faith, motivated by your gospel, your grace, by the love you've shown us. Keep maturing us missionally. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.